What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video, we're gonna be talking about bacterial endotoxins versus exotoxins. Before we get started, it's super important that if you guys truly wanna understand this topic, go down in the description box below. We'll have a link to our website. On our website, we have comprehensive notes, we have illustrations before everything's filled out and after everything's filled out, so it's going to really enhance your understanding of this topic. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get into it. All right, Ninja Nerds, so let's get started talking about endotoxins first. So what I want you guys to know really quickly is first off, what kind of bacteria produce endotoxins? Do you guys remember from our kind of like structure and function of bacteria where the endotoxin is particularly located within the bacteria? It's located in the outer membrane of the bacteria. Which bacteria, gram positive or gram negative, have an outer membrane? Gram negative bacteria. So therefore endotoxins can only be found in gram negative bacteria. So let's write that down. Let's ha pretend we have a gram negative bacteria right here. So we have a gram negative bacteria. These are the only ones that have endotoxins because it's found where? In the outer membrane. Okay, beautiful. Well, that, that actually kind of goes back to what we talked about in the structure and function of bacteria video, which was what was the name of that endotoxin that we found within the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. Do you guys remember? It was called lipopolysaccharides. We like to abbreviate it though because we're, we're simple sometimes and we say that this is the LPS, the lipopolysaccharides. And the lipopolysaccharide has three points and we'll talk about that in just a second, the lipid A, the core polysaccharide, and the O antigen. But that's the thing that has the disease or really negative kind of uh, connotations to it, okay? So endotoxins are gram negative, they're actually produced by gram negative bacteria, they're found in the outer membrane, the specific type is lipopolysaccharides, okay? Another thing to remember about this is that structure, the components of the endotoxin is actually made by the bacterial DNA or bacterial chromosome, okay? So that's important to remember, so it's incorporated from the bacterial chromosome. So what I want us to do is actually kind of quickly zoom in on the structure of the lipopolysaccharide and then talk about what we really want to focus on is all of the negative effects of that lipopolysaccharide on the actual host. In this case, if it infects a human, what are the negative effects of it? So here I have a bacteria. We're going to zoom in on that bacteria on the actual cell wall and cell envelope and take a look at its layers, but particularly focusing on one particular component, right? So from the inner aspect of that actual complete kind of uh, cell envelope or cell wall, we have the bacterial DNA with some ribosomes. Then here we have our inner membrane, right? Here we have our peptidoglycan layer. Here is the outer membrane, and then this green part would be like the capsule or the slime layer, right? Okay, within the outer membrane, you have the three components here of the lipopolysaccharide. The first one here is this red structure, and this red structure is really the negative part of the actual lipopolysaccharide or the endotoxin, and this is called lipid A. And what I want you to remember about lipid A is that lipid A is the immunogenic component of the actual lipopolysaccharide. So let's actually write that down. This is the part that actually causes a lot of the immune system issues. So we're gonna say it's immunogenic, okay? Then after that, we're not too worried about this next part, but this kind of blue part here is called your core polysaccharide. We'll just put CP, so your core polysaccharide. And then the last part we actually do wanna mention here is this purple part. And this purple component of the lipopolysaccharide is called the O, antigen. And what I want you to remember about the O antigen is that the O antigen is what's called uh, particularly not immunogenic, it's antigenic. So it's going to try to act as an antigen and trigger antibodies to react with it. Okay, so this is antigenic. And you can kind of get that from the name O antigen. Okay, so this is the part of the actual LPS or the endotoxin that allows for antibodies to attack. And then this is the part that activates the immune system and causes a lot of negative kind of damaging side effects. Okay. All right, beautiful. So we know gram negative bacteria have endotoxins. We know they're located in the outer membrane. We know the specific type, which is lipopolysaccharides. And we know the three components of the lipopolysaccharide with lipid A being the immunogenic component and the O antigen being the antigenic component. Okay, now here's where we gotta really get into it. How does these lipopolysaccharides, particularly the lipid A, trigger this negative kind of massive inflammatory side effects? Let's talk about that. 
Well, one of the big things is that this lipid A can act on macrophages. And we'll kind of show the mechanism in a second, but it loves to activate particular types of immune system cells. It also can activate particular types of complement proteins, and it also can activate very particular types of proteins that are involved in our coagulation cascade. So let's write these down. So the first thing that I want you to remember is that these lipopolysaccharides will love to activate macrophages. And this will cause a very interesting type of immunogenic reaction, which we'll talk about in a second. The second thing it'll actually do is activate our complement system. Okay, so it activates the complement system. Do you guys remember the complement system? So the complement system is these proteins that are produced by your liver. They have the different pathways, your classical pathway, your alternative pathway, your lectin pathway. It was all the C1, C4, C3, C5, all those different proteins that are part of our innate immune system. We'll talk about their mechanism, but they're also activated by these endotoxins. The last thing that this lipopolysaccharides or the endotoxins can also do is they activate a very nasty protein. Well, it can actually be, you know, it can lead to devastating side effects here, but it can activate something called tissue factor. You know tissue factor is a part of our coagulation cascade. We give another name for it though within the coagulation cascade. We also call it factor three. So it's also called factor three. It's a part of our extrinsic coagulation pathway. Okay, so big things to remember, okay? Boom, endotoxins, particularly lipopolysaccharides found in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria have three parts, and what do they do to cause the, the devastating side effects? Activate macrophages, which leads to massive inflammation, activates complement system activity, and activates tissue factor within the coagulation cascade. How does that actually cause problems, though? Let's talk about that. Let's start first with the macrophages. Okay, so let's say here we have the lipid A, right, of the lipopolysaccharides. And what happens is, here's a macrophage. You know what our macrophages, these little things are so cool, they have these molecules here called, they have these different types of proteins present on them called toll-like receptors. You know there's what's called toll-like receptor type four? There's also another molecule here that can be found on them called CD proteins, right? So you have another one here called a CD15 protein. But either way, you have these different proteins that are found on immune system cells like macrophages. What happens is the lipid A component of the lipopolysaccharides will bind to these proteins. When they bind to these proteins, they activate these macrophages and other immune system cells to trigger the release of some really devastating cytokines. Some of the cytokines that are released Three particular is you have interleukin-1 and interleukin-6, and you also release another molecule called TNF-alpha, and then one more molecule called nitric oxide. So there's a bunch of different cytokines that are released, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and nitric oxide. What do these things do? So once lipid A binds, activates the macrophage, cytokine release, what do these things do? Interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha, you know they love to actually act on a particular area within our central nervous system, our hypothalamus. And so what they do is, they act on the hypothalamus and stimulate the hypothalamus to increase our internal body temperature. Why? Because it makes it harder for bacteria to be able to thrive in a kind of a higher temperature environment. But this produces a fever. So it'll stimulate the hypothalamus by activating prostaglandin E2 production, which will lead to increasing our internal body temperature leading to fever. What else? TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, they also can increase kind of your vasodilatory mechanisms present on our blood vessels. So they'll also act on the blood vessels. And what they'll do on the blood vessels is they'll actually cause the blood vessels to be leaky. So they'll increase the capillary permeability of these actual blood vessels. You know what else? TNF-alpha can also cause the blood vessels to undergo vasodilation. So they'll cause vasodilation. So not only will they increase capillary permeability, but they'll also induce vasodilation. You know what else not nitric oxide does? Nitric oxide does the same kind of effect. It actually induces vasodilation. So we'll have vasodilation. And you're also going to have increased capillary permeability. 
What is the combined effect of these two things? Well, when you get vasodilation, you actually increase the diameter, you lower the peripheral resistance, and therefore drop the blood pressure. And if you have increased capillary permeability, you cause fluid to leak out, which lowers your effective arterial blood volume, and that lowers your blood pressure. So the overall effect of these two things is that this can lead to low blood pressure. What do we call low blood pressure? hypotension. And if you have hypotension that's sustained over a long period of time, this can cause devastating side effects on multiple organs and cause these organs to not be able to function. Why? Because you need to perfuse the tissues. If the tissues aren't being perfused, they don't get oxygen, they aren't able to generate ATP and perform their functions properly. And so you can start developing acute renal failure, acute liver failure, your heart can start failing, and you might actually not be able to oxygenate the blood as well properly. And so the overall side effect of this consistent hypotension is this can lead to what's called multi-system organ failure. And so whenever somebody has an infection that leads to fever, hypotension, and multi-system organ failure, this is usually a sign of septic shock or a septicemia type of effect. And that's what these endotoxins can do, is they can induce kind of a septic shock type of a, uh, appearance along with multi-system organ failure and dysfunction. And so that's one of the really, really interesting things about these endotoxins. Now, let's talk about the next one, which is the complement system. So we talked about how it activates macrophages, leads to this really, really nasty effect here of hypotension and fever and multi-system organ failure. What about these, this complement system activity? We've talked about the complement system on our immunology playlist. If you guys want more detail on that, go to watch that video. But within this general concept, endotoxins have the ability to activate our complement system, whether that be through the O antigen generating antibodies against it onto the bacteria and then the complement system actually binding to that antibody and then generating its whole cascade. The whole overall effect here is something very cool. So let's say that we, we pick that aspect of it. Let's say here I have the bacteria, All right? Here's our bacteria. And then on that, let's just say that we generate antibodies against the O antigen or against particular antigens of this bacteria, right? What happens is the complement system will come and bind to these antibodies or different parts of the bacteria and then basically generate what? membrane attack complexes that'll actually try to put holes into the bacteria. That's not the aspect of the complement system that we're talking about. Whenever you have this uh, classical pathway or alternative pathway, you pop off little kind of like uh, halves of the complement proteins. You know C3 and C5? They have two parts, a C3B, a C5B, and a C3A and a C5A. So when that happens is you end up popping off these things called C3A and C5A. And these proteins are very interesting because they have the inflammatory aspect to them. So let's say here we have C3A and then here we have C5A. What do these things do? Well, C3A is very interesting because it loves to activate certain types of cells like basophils or mast cells and trigger these cells to start producing a lot of histamine. So you'll get a lot of histamine release. Why is histamine a problem? Guess what histamine does? It increases vasodilation. It causes the actual smooth muscle cells to relax. And it also causes an increased capillary permeability by causing the endothelial cells to kind of contract a little bit too. If you cause vasodilation and increased capillary permeability, not only could you leave to potentially a lower blood pressure, but you know what else you could get out of this? Another effect from this is that you could get something like edema. So you can get swelling as well from an increased capillary permeability. So the big thing to remember here is that C3A, which is kind of a byproduct of the complement system activity, can lead to an increase in histamine release, leading to vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, leading to edema and potentially hypotension. What else? Something else is really cool about this. The C5A. The C5A loves to be able to activate other types of immune system cells. You know neutrophils? It loves to be able to stimulate the neutrophils. And when it stimulates the neutrophils, it tries to induce kind of a neutrophil chemotaxis.
And by causing this neutrophil chemotaxis, it's gonna kind of increase your inflammatory response because what you're doing is you're stimulating neutrophils to come to the area to where the bacteria is. When more neutrophils come to the area, they're gonna start trying to release a bunch of different types of destructive enzymes, breaking down different types of bacteria, and it's just going to enhance the inflammatory response. So as a result of having more neutrophils coming to the area, what are you gonna get? You're gonna get a lot of inflammation. Okay, and so that is another potential thing to think about with this increased neutrophil chemotaxis from these complement system activity. Okay, so we got macrophages causing this effect. We got complement system causing this effect. What is the last thing that we have to talk about? It's the tissue factor or factor three. How does endotoxins affect it? So here's what happens. Let's say here we have our tissue factor or factor three. Okay, so what happens is you have different ports of your lipopolysaccharides, right? And this will activate or stimulate this protein here, which is found within our blood vessels. We're just kind of zooming in on it. And this protein here is called factor three. We're just gonna put Roman numeral three there. So this is stimulated. What is the role of factor three or tissue factor? What does it do? I'm glad you asked. What it does is it gets into the blood vessel, right? It's in the blood. It activates a particular factor here called factor seven. So it'll stimulate factor seven. Factor seven then will activate what, what other factor? It'll activate factor 10. And then factor 10 will activate thrombin. And what does thrombin do? Thrombin helps to be able to convert fibrinogen into fibrin. And if you form fibrin, what does fibrin do? It basically helps to form like a fibrin mesh around clots that'll actually start to form against the actual blood vessel wall, leading to a thrombus. Well, if I have lots of lipopolysaccharides, a really heavy load of lipopolysaccharides, particularly the lipid A, that increases a lot of the factor three activity, that increases the conversion to factor seven, to activated factor 7A, and then to activate 10, activating thrombin, activating fibrin, what do you start doing? You start forming tons and tons of clots as a result. So as a result of this, from this increased kind of coagulation cascade activity, you get increased clots that are very widespread. But the downside of this <laughs> is that you use up, because you're forming all of these clots, you start depleting all of your actual coagulation proteins because you're consuming them to make tons of widespread clots. So as a result, there is a decrease in clotting proteins because they're becoming consumed. Let's put that down. They're consumed to make clots. And as a response to that, they have an increased risk of bleeding. You're like, what the heck? They clot and they bleed? Yes. What is that called? Whenever someone has an increased clots widespread throughout the body, but also have a predisposition to be able to bleed from an infection. That's called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And this is a very negative thing that can happen with endotoxins as well. All right, so that covers our concept on endotoxins. Now let's go ahead and start moving on talking about exotoxins. All right, exotoxins. Now, these are very interesting because there is so many different types of exotoxins in comparison to the endotoxins, the lipopolysaccharides you find in like gram-negative bacteria. Like, we didn't talk about types, but like gram-negative rods, for example, E. coli, salmonella, those would be examples. Neisseria meningitidis could also be a, a, like a gram-negative coxide that you could also see endotoxins for. But for exotoxins, what would you see these in? What kind of bacteria? So we said primarily gram-negative for endotoxins. Guess what? Exotoxins can be both gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria. So that is important to remember. Exotoxins can be found in both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, both. Now, we talked about how with gram-negative bacteria, they have the outer membrane which contains the lipopolysaccharides. And basically, how those lipopolysaccharides actually produce their devastating effect, the endotoxins, is you have like some type of bacterial lysis or destruction and it releases those LPSs from the outer membrane. For gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria that make exotoxins, it's actually made inside the cell. They're proteins. They're proteins. And they're actually, so they're proteins that are made inside of the cell and then they are excreted from the cell. 
So they're excreted from the cell. That is an extremely important concept that you need to be able to remember, okay? Endotoxins are LPSs found in the outer membrane. They usually are released whenever you have bacterial cell destruction. Exotoxins are found on gram-positive, gram-negative. They're proteins that are made in the cell and are excreted from the cell. Beautiful. Now, these proteins that are exotoxins can affect different types of host cells in three particular types of ways. This is the easiest way to kind of categorize them. So there's type one, type two, type three. Type one is they act as something called a super antigen. You're like, what that mean, man? Don't worry, I got you. So they act as something called a super antigen and that's how they kind of evoke their negative kind of side effects or negative effects. How does this work? The basic concept of it is let's say here's an exotoxin that's getting released from this bacterial cell. When that exotoxin is released, you have two different cells here. So let's say here, this blue cell is what's called an antigen presenting cell. Maybe it's a dendritic cell, maybe it's a B cell, maybe it's a macrophage. And this pink cell here is what's called a T cell, okay, like a T helper cell. The T helper cell and the antigen presenting cell, they interact with one another, how? Your MHC2 molecules with the CD4 molecules and the T cell receptors, right? All of those things allow for them to interact. Well, guess what? The exotoxin kind of acts like a super antigen and it binds onto this, this actual connection between the MHC2 molecules and the actual T cell receptors. And so when you interact there, it kind of acts as like a little kind of like a stimulatory mechanism. It enhances the interaction between the antigen presenting cell and the T cell. As a response to that, these T cells, they start releasing massive amounts of cytokines and these cytokines just enhance our inflammatory reaction as a response and so from this you get an increased inflammatory response and this is the thing that can actually produce disease or the negative effects of the, uh, whatever actual bacteria this is okay so that is the big thing that i want you guys to remember for type one so type one are super antigens they modulate the activity between antigen presenting cells and t cells by interacting between that mhc and cd4 and tcr interaction particularly enhancing the inflammatory response beautiful type two exotoxins type 2 exotoxins are interesting because these exotoxins actually exert their effects directly on the cell by trying to damage the cell so they want to damage the cell directly okay whether that be putting pores so for example they may put pores into the cell membrane and lead to things leaking in or leaking out of the cell right they may also particularly just produce destruction. So they may actually damage particular parts of the cell membrane and cause damage to the actual cell membrane itself. So either way, they may have direct cytotoxic effects on the cell membrane. They may put pores into the cell membrane, which alters a lot of the electrolyte and water kind of movement, which can lead to destruction of the cell. So they have direct kind of devastating or damaging effects to the actual cell. That is this one, okay? So again, this is particularly they have direct kind of cell damaging effect. And again, we use the example of them putting like pores into the membrane or breaking down the actual phospholipid bilayer. The third type, which is actually the most common type, is they work through particular mechanisms. And one of the most common mechanisms is they can exert what's called an AB toxin. So some of these actual bacteria have what's called AB toxins. So they have an alpha unit and a beta subunit. And what happens is, let's say that here you have this exotoxin and it binds onto a particular protein on a target cell. When it binds onto this particular uh, protein on the target cell, it can get taken up into the actual target cell. And then once inside of the actual cell, it can exert its effect by particularly inhibiting protein synthesis or maybe modulating the activity of particular enzymes or proteins inside of the cell. That's one of the mechanisms by which they can get into the cell is this AB toxin effect. There is another effect is where some bacteria, especially like Yersinia pestis, they actually can inject their back to, uh, inject their actual toxin, endo exotoxin, directly. And so let's say that here we have a bacteria. It may have what's called an injectosome. And from that injectosome, so let's say here's a little nasty bacteria, 
like Yersinia, it actually has what's called an injectosome, and it can pass on some of these actual exotoxins directly through the injectosome, okay? But either way, the whole concept of type three is they exert their effects by causing the toxin to be taken up into the cell, and once it's inside of the cell, it exerts its effects by its second messenger systems, by altering the activity of particular enzymes or proteins or inhibiting protein synthesis in general. And that can produce the devastating effects on the host cells. Okay, so again, quick recap type one, they modulate the activity of the antigen presenting cell T cell interaction by acting as a super antigen, increasing the inflammatory response. Type two is the exotoxins cause direct cell damaging effects by pores or breaking down the actual cell membrane. And the third type, which is the most common, is you wanna really remember this particular type here, is they can get in, the exotoxins actually help to bind onto proteins, get taken into the cell, and exert their actual effects by second messenger systems, altering protein synthesis, and altering protein activity by the AB toxin method. But there is also the injectosome method where you have a bacteria that literally uses a particular kind of structure to inject the exotoxin directly into the host cell. That is the most common one and the one that I really want you guys to remember. Now, let's take quickly the most important kind of examples of type one exotoxins, type two, and type three exotoxins. So the first one that I want you guys to remember here is Staphylococcus aureus for type one. Type one, there's a very specific type of exotoxin that actually can act as a super antigen. There's two types if you really wanna remember them. One of them is called T toxic shock syndrome toxin, so toxic shock syndrome toxin type one. So that is one of the particular types of exotoxins that it exerts its mechanism be a type one effect. There is another one that Staphylococcus aureus releases, and this is called an enterotoxin. So it does release something called an enterotoxin that has the ability to be able to also exert that super antigen effect, okay? Streptococcus pyogenes. So this is a bacteria that can release another type of uh, exotoxin that has a type one exotoxin effect. And this is called the erythrogenic toxin. And this is a really interesting toxin that has the ability to produce something called like scarlet fever. And again, we'll talk about that when we talk about Streptococcus pyogenes by itself. And again, we'll go into more detail into these exotoxins when we talk about a lot of these bacteria individually. Okay, but again, this is just some of the examples of exotoxins of the type one category. Toxic shock syndrome, to toxin type one, the enterotoxin of Staphylococcus aureus, and the erythrogenic toxin of Streptococcus pyogenes. They exert their actual negative effects via this mechanism. Okay, type two, where it exerts a direct kind of cell damaging effect. Staphylococcus aureus, it actually releases something called, what's called a, um, a streptolysin. Okay, so it has what's called a streptolysin protein that it can release, and that can actually cause kind of dis destructing uh, like effects of the actual cell membranes. There's another one too, uh, and this one is actually called a leuco Cytin. It's called a, there's what's called a palin, palatine va uh, valin leukocytin protein. And this actually can produce pores in different types of holes within leukocytes. So there is different types of toxins that can be released, um, particularly exotoxins of the type two category, like streptolysin from Staphylococcus aureus and leukocytin from Staphylococcus aureus. Now, another one here will be an example of Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens, which we're actually gonna talk about this toxin, it releases something called the alpha toxin. And the alpha toxin will exert its effects again via this type two mechanism, which we'll talk about a little bit later. All right, so let's talk about a couple of different types of bacteria that actually release or make and secrete uh, type three exotoxins, which is the most common type, right? So again, Cornibacterium diphtheriae, they release particularly like a diphtheria toxin, right? Pseudomonas aeruginosa, they release something called an exotoxin type A. Shigella releases a Shiga toxin. E. coli releases a Shiga-like toxin. Vibrio cholera, this is the one that we'll actually talk about as an example here. It releases something called the chloral toxin. Bacillus anthracis releases the anthrax toxin. 
Bordetella pertussis releases the pertussis toxin. Clostridium tetani releases the tetanospasmin, which is a type of neurotoxin. And then Clostridium botulinum can actually cause the botulinum toxin. So all of these release particular types of exotoxins. And for the most part, their name is kind of with inside of the actual toxin, the name of the bacteria. So that kind of tells us the examples of exotoxins, type one, type two, type three. We know how they differ. We know some of the bacteria that release type one, type two, or type three exotoxins. Now what I want us to quickly discuss is examples, at least one example of a type one, a type two, and a type three exotoxin. All right guys, so let's talk about some examples of some exotoxins within those three types of categories that I talked to you. Again, so again, exotoxins are released by gram positive or gram negative bacteria. It's proteins. They're made in the cell, excreted from the cell. Now, another interesting point about these is that when we talked about the type one through type three, it explained their mechanism, but let's talk about type one as an example. So Staphylococcus aureus, we talked about one of those and let's use the example of the TSST type one, the toxic shock syndrome uh, toxin type one. How does this actual toxin work by exerting that super antigen type of effect? So let's imagine here that here you have this protein. It's released by the Staphylococcus aureus. Usually this happens whenever you have like, um, for example, if someone has like a nasal packing and the bacteria that's on the nasal packing stays with inside the area for a long time, or tampons that are left in for a very long time, or like if someone has a surgical procedure and they get like a lap pad that's like left in there and the bacteria is, is there for a long period of time, it can release these types of exotoxins and this one particularly. And what this does is, is that again, it acts as a super antigen and actually allows for this kind of connection between the antigen presenting cells and the T cells. And it amplifies this interaction between them. And as a response to that, these T cells start making tons of cytokines like interleukin-1, like interleukin-2, like TNF-alpha, like interferon gamma, there's just so many of these. And what it does is it causes this massive cytokine storm. And these cytokines do a couple different things. One is they act on the hypothalamus. Like you know the interleukin-1, the TNF-alpha, they love to act on the hypothalamus. And basically as a response to that, increase the prostacyclin production, PGE2, cause the hypothalamus to increase our internal body temperature and lead to fever. It also loves to be able to activate an inflammatory reaction within the skin. And when it activates an inflammatory reaction within the skin, it starts causing a lot of redness, it starts causing a lot of heat, it starts causing a lot of inflammation of the skin. And as a result of that, you start to develop something like a rash. What else? It also, these cytokines, love to act on the blood vessels. And they like to make the blood vessels really leaky. And that causes an increase in capillary permeability. It also causes the blood vessels to undergo some vasodilatory effect. And as a result of that vasodilatory effect, what can happen? With increased capillary permeability, you lose fluid from the blood vessel. And if the blood vessel dilates, your resistance goes down. As a result, this can lead to hypotension or low blood pressure. And so this is kind of one of the classic triads of toxic shock syndrome is fever, rash, and hypotension, usually from this bacteria Staphylococcus aureus. So that's an example of the type one, but you see how it acting as a super antigen via that type one mechanism produces this devastating effect of exotoxins. And again, exotoxins are relatively fatal in comparison to endotoxins, which have a lower kind of fatality rate. Usually as their concentration of the endotoxins are go high, 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 you can have more fatality, but you only need kind of a lower concentration of exotoxins to be fatal, which is another difference between endotoxins and exotoxins. All right, let's talk about the type Type two exotoxins. Alrighty, so let's talk about this next guy, which is the Clostridium perfringens. So this is a type two, it releases a type two exotoxin. So you know whenever you get like a, uh, let's say that you get a cut, right? You get like a good wound. And from that wound, the Clostridium perfringens kind of infiltrates into that wound. What it does is, once it's in the wound, it can actually start releasing it. So it has proteins, right? It has those endo uh, exotoxins made in it within it, and then it starts releasing it. When it releases these exotoxins, the particular type of exotoxin that we're going to talk about is called the alpha toxin. The alpha toxin has particular types of receptors that are present on different types of cells. For example, let's say that this is like on a muscle cell or a skin cell, okay? 
What the alpha toxin does is it binds on to these different types of receptors. When it binds on to the receptors, it activates a protein. You know there's a protein uh, called phospholipase C? You know phospholipase C is an enzyme that's basically found with inside of the actual kind of cell. It's, a, it's basically an enzymatic uh, structure that breaks down a particular molecule. You know there's a molecule called PIP2, which is incorporated into the cell membrane, the phospholipase C will break down the PIP2 and breaks it down into what's called DAG and it breaks it down into another molecule called IP3. Well, basically what happens is if you break down the actual cell membrane, by, in, by utilizing this PIP2, which is a part of the cell membrane, that's leading to some kind of usage and destruction of the cell membrane. And on top of that, you know DAG, which is one of the byproducts down here? It's gonna activate something called protein kinase C. And protein kinase C is gonna activate particular types of like transcription factors, which activate genes. And these genes are gonna lead to the, in, the actual production of very specific types of proteins. Some of these proteins are like interleukin-8. There's also an increased production of reactive oxygen species as a result. You know what reactive oxygen species do? They love to cause damage to the actual cell membrane. They love to damage proteins and actually damage the DNA. But you get some destruction of the actual cell membrane from the reactive oxygen species. You know what interleukin-8 does? Interleukin-8 will actually come out and activate particular types of immune system cells that are present with inside the blood, which are our neutrophils. It's gonna to try to stimulate these neutrophils to come to the area. But you know what's very interesting? One more thing is really interesting. Not only do you have a lot of interleukin-8 release to try to cause neutrophils to come to the area, and when the neutrophils come to the area, they're gonna actually start causing devastating effects to the cell membrane. You have reactive, reactive oxygen species causing damage to the cell membrane. You have phospholipase C utilizing tons of phospholipids from the cell membrane, but there's one more pathway. PIP2 also can get broken down, or you can have what's called arachidonic acid, and then arachidonic acid can get broken down eventually into something called thromboxane A2. Thromboxane A2, you know what it does? It actually causes vasoconstriction of blood vessels. So it's gonna cause these blood vessels to vasoconstrict. If you vasoconstrict the blood vessels, what does that mean for the amount of oxygen that's gonna be delivered from these actual vessels uh, through the blood to this tissue cell? What happens to the amount of oxygen? It decreases. And so there's a decreased amount of oxygen that's being delivered to this actual tissue cell. And that can start leading to a decrease in ATP production and the cell can start dying as well. So the overall effect is, remember, type 2 produce their effects by trying to damage the cell membrane. How are we damaging the actual cell membrane or putting pores into the cell membrane? That was the other mechanism. Well, we're damaging the cell membrane by a couple ways. One is we're activating enzymes to break down the phospholipids within the cell membrane to make molecules like thromboxane A2, to make molecules like DAG. We also have reactive oxygen species which are directly damaging the cell membrane. We have interleukin-8, which is activating neutrophils. Neutrophils will come to the area and release particular types of molecules that will damage the cell membrane. And thromboxane A2 also causes vasoconstriction of the blood vessels, less oxygen being delivered to the tissue, and that can also cause the cell to undergo less ATP, less ability to power the pumps, and so the cell can also start having injury as well. So multiple mechanisms by which this actual uh, exotoxin exerts its negative effects, which again is, is the alpha toxin released by clostridium perfringens. Let's now talk about the last one, which is the type three exotoxin. All right, so the last type of exotoxin is type three exotoxins. The, a good example of this one is the actual cholera. So cholera toxin is actually released by this Vibrio species, right? Uh, and so what happens is this chloral toxin, okay? You know what this, this son of a gun does? This thing is a really nasty one. It produces its effects on particularly the gastrointestinal tract. Remember I told you that type 3 exotoxins can work by the alpha, the AB toxin type of mechanism, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But basically, the AB toxin is the mode by which they get into the cell. And then once in the cell, they can exert their effects by either inhibiting protein synthesis, altering cell signaling mechanism, or altering the activity of particular types of proteins and enzymes, right? But it's the mode by which they get into the cell, which is the AB toxin, or the injectosome example. Once in the cell, the actual mechanism by which they modify the activity of the host cell is by cell signaling mechanisms, 
altering protein synthesis or altering the activity of particular enzymes. So how does this do it? Well, what it does is that it actually causes damage to a lot of the intestinal cells and leads to massive amounts of watery diarrhea right? That they, they use that term kind of like the, the rice water kind of stools. Now, how does it actually do this? So let's say here we have the clarotoxin we're going to kind of use as this circle here. It binds on to a particular type of protein that are found on the enterocytes within the intestinal cells, right? And there's two parts of it. Let's actually kind of represent this as like little circles here. You have what's called the, the B unit and you have the A unit of the actual clarotoxin. The B unit is what's binding to the actual proteins on the intestinal cells. Once it does that, the A unit is the part that actually enters into the actual intestinal cells. So the B unit is for binding, the A unit is for actually entering into the, excel, into the cell. So here's our A unit. Why is this important? When the actual clerotoxin binds onto this actual receptor, it does, it does particularly something very, very interesting. You know there's a protein located inside of the, the actual cell membrane, um, and this is usually coupled with the G proteins. This protein is a G protein, so this is a G protein. And you have different types, like G stimulatory, G alpha, a bunch of different types of G proteins. What happens is whenever you have different things like this toxin binding onto the receptor, it can stimulate this G protein. And this G protein will then bind onto a particular enzyme. You know this enzyme? We utilize the abbreviation AC, adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase will then do something. You know G proteins, G proteins are basically, they contain on them a molecule called GTP, right? So they have a molecule on them called GTP. When the G protein binds to the adenylate cyclase, it activates the adenylate cyclase, which takes ATP and converts it into what's called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP then goes and activates protein kinase A. Protein kinase A then goes and phosphorylates these different types of chloride channels that are present on the cell membrane near the intestinal lumen. So again, what happens here? The AB toxin, the AB component of this clerotoxin binds onto the receptor. When it binds onto the receptor, it can activate the G protein, convert ATP into cyclic AMP via this adenylate cyclase, which is activated. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, which phosphorylates chloride channels. Now, here's where we get it. we're gonna have something interesting happen. The A unit, when it's inside the cell, it locks this G protein into an activation mode. In other words, it can't become deactivated. It stays activated. So normally what happens is that usually after the G protein, which has the GTP binds to the adenylate cyclase, it becomes deactivated and has to go get recoupled with GTP. The A subunit of the chloral toxin keeps the actual G protein in an activated state, so it just keeps stimulating adenylate cyclase. As a result, if you just keep stimulating adenylate cyclase, you're gonna increase the ATP conversion to cyclic AMP, and you're gonna increase the activation of protein kinase A. You're gonna increase the phosphorylation of these chloride channels. As a result, tons and tons of chloride are going to exit out of these intestinal cells and following with it is going to be water. So you're gonna to get tons of chloride and tons of water that's being spilled out into the actual intestinal lumen. And that is gonna to lead to the watery diarrhea effect that you see. Okay, so again, quickly chlorotoxin, which is again, working through a type three mechanism, when it actually exerts its effects, it binds onto a receptor. What part? The B unit. Activates the G protein, which activates adenylate cyclase, converting ATP to cyclic AMP to protein kinase A, phosphorylating the chloride channels. Once the B unit binds, the A unit is the part that gets into the cell. The A unit binds to the G protein and keeps it in an activated state, so it can't be deactivated. If it stays activated, it continues to stimulate the adenylate cyclase. That continues to convert more ATP to cyclic AMP, increase your protein kinase A, and then it for phosphorylate more of those chloride channels and more chloride, more water spills out, and that's how you lose a ton of that and leading to the watery diarrhea effect. That is the example of type three exotoxins, and that finishes our lecture on endotoxins and exotoxins of bacteria. All right, engineers, in this video, we talk about bacterial endotoxins and exotoxins. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.